Hi guys, my name is Sean, your host for today, and this is the Titan Digital Asset Group Podcast, where we have discussions with thought leaders in the crypto and blockchain space. My guest today is George Goh. He is the co-founder and CEO of Titan Digital Asset Group, and George is also my older brother. So George, how are you doing today in, in San Francisco? Hey Sean, uh, I'm doing well. It's, a, it's nice and sunny out here in San Francisco. It's gotten um, a little cold recently, but today is today's a nice, nice day, so I'm uh, pretty thankful for that. Okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. I, I usually don't speak to you in in English. Usually we, we speak Chinese, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I can, I'll start asking you a few questions and I think... Totally, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the first one, the first question that I have is, can you tell the viewers more about your background, your education, your transition into finance, and your journey into the cryptocurrency space? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. And so I guess just to start from the beginning, you know, I grew up in the tropics, right, in the Philippines with two sisters and two brothers uh, in a pretty traditional business-oriented family. And so naturally, I chose to major in business um, when I went to college at USC, uh, but decided to also do a second degree in computer science um, as well, just because I, I thought the skill sets, you know, from both sort of disciplines were super complementary. Um, and in, in light of like today's world too, right, where disruptive business technologies kind of happen at a regular cadence of like once every five-ish years, as opposed to, to like every 15 years in the 20th century or like 100 years or so before, before, before then. And so, you know, I mean, like my dad was a business major or our dad was a business major or, you know, mom was a CS major and they both sort of pitched me their respective majors. Um, but I thought kind of, hey, I wanted to make them both proud. So why not do both? Um, so, yeah, like right out of college, I followed a pretty traditional path doing investment banking, particularly in the distressed and special situations arena. And, um, and banking was great, right? Banking was great because you got to see a lot of different business models at a, at a fairly young age, just cranking through deal after deal. And so the, the, the reality is, like, is you work double or more the hours of a regular job. Uh, but I truly think you learn uh, double or more as well because you're forced to adapt. Um, it's, it's really like sink or swim out there. Um, after that, the next stage of my career was, um, was in private equity investing, specifically at this um, operationally focused fund that does deals in kind of the, the 200 to, I'd say, 700, 800 million dollar range. And so um, this was a pretty natural transition for me, I, I would say, as I went from providing advice um, in banking to taking the next step, which is really just getting my hands dirty in, uh, in directly structuring and diligencing deals um, and then helping drive like operational alpha in portfolio companies once once we bought them. And so um, this experience kind of like really hit the sweet spot for me with this like elusive blend of finance, ops and strategy. Um, you've got, got a nice chance to, to learn from some very sharp but also like very friendly people. Um, and that's kind of the boring stuff, right? With, 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 with sort of regards to crypto, I first heard of Bitcoin back in 2011 uh, to 2012 while doing research for my cryptography class under uh, Professor Leonard Edelman. And great professor, by the way, a super funny guy, obviously very legit, kind of given that he won the Turing Award and is the A in the RSA public key crypto system. And, and but, but yeah, at that point, I kind of thought it was interesting, that the tech was interesting and still a ways away from being a, a true game changer. Um, so I didn't think too much of it then um, and only sort of followed it somewhat passively. Um, it was actually like more recently it was it was Tao Tao, right? One of my best friends from college, um, and my fellow Titan co-founder who got me seriously looking at the space. I just remember like he would he would he would call me every week and went on sort of full Bitcoin Jesus mode, like selling me on the merits of crypto and, and the awesomeness of this magical internet money. And he wouldn't stop calling me until I bought some Ethereum back when Ethereum was, was a lot cheaper than what it is today, which which in hindsight kind of like functioned like a tuition check, right? So like I was forced to learn and follow the crypto markets once I had bought in and had skin in the game. And, you know, it really changed my perspective on, on the tech was seeing just the developments of the, the industry um, in, in like the last couple of years, like witnessing the rise of these like Turing complete um, smart contracts platforms like like Ethereum, Neo, EOS, um, that, that made crypto really click for me. And I think once, once crypto clicks for you, sort of once you realize how broadly disruptive this could be and how... You know, to me at least, like crypto appears to be part of a multi-decadal like paradigm shift versus like just a fad. Um, I think it's really difficult to be thinking about anything else. And so, like, all I want to do now is like talk about crypto with anyone who will listen to me at sort of the risk of becoming like one of those like tasteless Bitcoin profits out there floating around on Reddit or some other forum. Um, but ultimately, and I think like 
we, we wrote our first blog post on Medium about this. Like we, I guess we being like me and Tao Tao and eventually the broader team, uh, we sort of coalesced around Titan as a way to marry our skill sets from both our experiences in, in traditional, you know, private equity, long short hedge funds, um, investment banks, um, as well as from our personal crypto investing endeavors, um, so that you know we thought we could really drive impact in a frontier market like this. Yes, I think that's an that's a very excellent answer, and thank you for the the, the comprehensive story behind uh, your background and your you know the background of of how you got into cryptocurrencies. So mm-hmm. the next question that I have for you is. Can you explain uh, Titan's investment philosophy? Yeah, sure, I'd love to. And so I think when I think about Titan, we're, we're obviously this actively managed fund, right? With an investment thesis that's based upon like longer term, quote unquote, like value investing to the extent that applies in this space for now, um, where we sort of try to get high conviction that we are among the best informed investors um, before deploying capital into an asset. And so what this really means is that we, is that we focus on um, fundamental analysis, right? This is like tops down from a total addressable market TAM perspective, bottoms up unit economics, a deep dive on a project's architecture and its tech stack um, through sort of like our in-house engineers. Um, and so this fundamentally sort of research ideas, like this theme like just fits our backgrounds more, just coming from traditional roles in finance, consulting and engineering. And and look, we'll still use technical and event-driven analysis to, to tactically allocate the fund so that we can ensure like optimal positioning in the near term. But primarily, I think the focus for Titan is like fundamentally research intrinsic value, right? So in other words, essentially, like, we'll, use, we'll use fundamental research to decide whether or not we deem an asset worthy of long-term capital allocation in, in our portfolio. If the answer is yes, then we use technical and event-driven analysis to determine our entry strategy. Um, what we're not is like we're not these HFTs, like high-frequency traders, who, whose main strategy is to ride daily volatility or, or trade the ballet of the charts. Um, that's just not our table to win, given there are smarter guys out there doing this stuff already. And I think we have to be like very focused on table selection here. Um, our value add is really more just driving professional due diligence in an inefficient market um, where information asymmetries still exist, right? Helping educate the rest of the community and really providing patient and sophisticated capital um, and partnership branded capital too, right? To the projects that, that we invest in. So in, in my mind, we're not just providing vanilla capital to these guys, we're providing kind of like capital plus, right? And, and look, at the end of the day, I think, yeah, we believe there's a real opportunity here to be like the professional, you know, adults at the table, uh, be among the first experts in this wild west. Um, and, and, you know, I think the point on the market being inefficient, just lending itself to, to professional money managers, like, I guess being being allowed to make above market returns, that's pretty key, right? In public equities, um, you know, in contrast, and, and even in private equity, right? The market is, is too efficient. There's too much capital, too much rent power chasing too few good deals. Um, and, and so you have to work like really, really hard to be just 1% smarter than the three guys who are like an hour behind you. Hopefully that makes sense. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think the, the crypto markets are still at a very early age. And a lot of people in the the crypto community say that, um, you know, crypto is like the Wild West where there's a lot of opportunities still. Um, and I guess that's not the same, that's not true for traditional capital markets. So mm-hmm. yeah, can you explain, I think you sort of hinted at this uh, early on, but can you explain why you think the crypto market is inefficient and uh, maybe why this may be good for an investor? Yeah, and um, it's a really it's a really interesting question, and um, I sort of to put on like my, my academia like hat here. Just the way I look at it is through sort of uh, the traditional efficient efficient like markets hypothesis, right? Like EMH, um, which basically says that investors cannot generate above market returns, aka alpha, uh, because prices uh, prices reflect all available information. And I think the three assumptions like underlying the EMH, um, which sort of I talked about this in the white paper as well, um, I don't think that they hold in the crypto world. So well, I guess the first is like sort of like perfect information, right? This assumption that all info, info is like readily available and everyone knows it. Um, that's just like not the case in crypto. 
um, information is, is, is extremely fragmented in this world with different bits of information just um, across a variety of channels, Slack, Reddit, Twitter, you know, YouTube videos, you name it, right? Uh, the due diligence that for this for, for, for sort of investments is, is also very like esoteric, just given the, the use of crypto with the majority of investors being, being retail investors, still learning how to differentiate it between assets that will exist in the long term and those that will not. And so I think in my mind, like this in combination with the lack of secondary research, like there's no JPM or UBS coverage out there. Um, this results in like a very time intensive process in which uh, people are forced to do a lot of primary research, like dig through heaps of info, a lot of which must be filtered out for noise and like kind of really audited for, for reliability, um, just to isolate the one or two crucial bits that truly matter. And not everyone is going to do this, right? Hard, hard work, I think, in this space uh, translate into better information than the market and thus serve as a driver for alpha. Um, so that's kind of the first assumption. The second assumption, I think, of the EMH is, is like rational actors, right? Like sort of the, believing that people act in their best economic interests uh, based on like sound analysis. I already mentioned that most kind of market participants are in relatively less informed retail hands. Um, so to me, I think the, the, the market is still very much sentiment driven. As many investors just want to, you know, quote unquote, like, get rich quick. Like you have these one Lambo guys who are trying to make enough to buy like one car and they're out. Um, these guys may have just bought in on hype without spending the effort to get smart on a crypto asset and its underlying tech before making their first purchase. And so people um, here, they, they buy and sell regardless of having a view on quote unquote fundamental value. Uh, but at some point, um, I think at some point, right, the market will have to shift to some of these more traditional metrics, and a professional investor can try to get ahead of that. Um, so that's kind of the second point there. The third point, the third kind of assumption um, is low transaction costs, right? And perhaps this this assumption uh, of low transaction costs, like um, of the EMH, this, this probably holds better than the former two assumptions. Um, you know, gas prices needed to complete transactions are reasonable, less than a dollar um, for Ethereum versus you know five dollars up to two hundred dollars per, per stock trade, right? Um, however, for, for more thinly capitalized tokens, which uh, trade, I guess have a, which have, have a lower trading volume or or just like a limited number of exchange listings, um, the, there are hidden transaction costs there in the form of a wider um, bid versus ask spreads, um, which can be as high as like 10% plus of the token price. Um, and so this really just creates friction that works against um, a market that reflects perfect information. Um, so, so ultimately, ultimately yes, right? We, we, we do think there is, there is an opportunity here to beat the market, but it's obviously not without risks. Um, you know, volatility, liquidity, custody, reg regulation, scalability, uh, the list goes on and on, but at the end of the day, there's there's just no free launch, right? You still get paid for taking risk. Yes, I think that's an excellent point. And I think a lot of the retail investors we see today, they think of uh, cryptocurrencies not necessarily as investments, but they think of it, at least the way they invest, they think of it as mm. uh, choosing different types of cereals. So some of them like Cocoa Crunch, some of them <laughs> like, like Fruit Loops, yeah. and some of them want uh, Honey Nut Cheerios, right? And they just... Ask um, every, let's say they'll ask your friend, you know, do you prefer Cocoa Crunch or Honey Nut Cheerios? And that's, they'll just buy a trade, buy a token without understanding um, its underlying technology. So, yeah, ex I think excellent point on on your totally, end. Yeah. And, and I'm more of a Cocoa Crunch kind of guy, by the way, just to, just to clarify. Okay. So what verticals do you think there are in the cryptocurrency space right now? And then... How do you think about investable verticals in the crypto space, and can you share can you share with us a few of these today? Man, um, yeah, totally. And look, there's a lot to talk about here. I could go on um, for pretty long, um, right? But but I would say at Titan, we, we we tend to rally more around themes um, rather than verticals. And so right now, we don't have specific verticals of focus as of yet. But there are certain projects that we're enthusiastic about that do have common themes. And, you know, to, I guess to take a step back, we're even thinking about our theme-based approach. The first filter we have is just simply like product market fit, like why the blockchain and not an existing centralized solution. And so we want to invest in projects that lend themselves naturally to blockchain strengths. And this usually around delivering utility that is based upon, uh, in my mind, uh, the four strengths of like distributed ledger technology being sort of like one, judgment resistance, 
two, um, like immutability, three, like decentralization slash broad points of failure, and, and four, uh, trustlessness, right? So, so going back to themes, we can obviously add or modify our investable themes regularly, and no one theme is guaranteed to stick forever. Um, but one example of an investable theme that is pretty topical right now is investing in projects that tackle scaling solutions, given the recent block, uh, bottlenecks that we've seen recently in these blockchain networks. So, so for instance, we could invest in so-called layer two solutions, such as Raiden, um, Enigma, or IXX, which are these side or off-chain networks that process transactions outside of a main blockchain like Ethereum, right? Basically, to, to alleviate the main chain from too much transaction load, but may still use the main chain as a settlement layer because the main chain is more secure and immutable. And that might sound like kind of confusing, so maybe I'll use an analogy here, right? So, so, so maybe Sean, um, let's say that you and I are best friends, um, and, and, and like you're my brother, so I guess that's kind of true, but you know, don't tell Tao Tower his feelings might get hurt. Um, but, but let's say you, you and I are best friends and we get lunch every day. And because I'm super forgetful, I never bring my wallet with me, so, so you have to spot me most of the time. And so, but instead of being inefficient and paying you back every day, I just pay you back once a week or something. So you still have to calculate what we ordered and like how much I owe you on a daily basis, but I just build up my weekly tab so that I settle on, say, every Sunday. And um, you know, that weekly accounting and settlement is something that would happen on a main chain like Ethereum, but the daily work is done on like a rated. And basically, so you, like, you do these like little uh, less mission critical but laborious tasks off chain, um, but the important things such as settlement, um, scarce resource allocation, work validation, that, that stuff would still ultimately be done on chain. Um, and, and so consistent with this like scaling issue theme is, is another theme where we think that over like the next 12 to 24 months, um, maybe more, honestly, like mo most of the value in the space will accrue to, you know, the, the middleware layer of the blockchain tech stack, because um, you got to lay the pipes, uh, the plumbing, the roads down before you can actually have a city. So we think that um, infrastructure based projects that provide solutions to today's crypto to crypto pain points will see value realized quicker in the near term, um, which will then in turn, like drive the rollout of projects built on top of these middleware solutions that can ultimately target end, end, end uh, customers. So, you know, some examples just to throw out there, like these could be stable coins, off-chain computation, uh, digital identity is an important one, um, and decentralized exchanges uh, or DEXs. Uh, so, for example, ZRX, that's a pretty interesting protocol, uh, which lets like third parties build user-facing uh, decentralized exchanges or lets DAP developers build back-end token exchange functions, um, which, which really tackles the existing pain points of today's centralized exchange solutions. Um, you, you know, we, everyone kind of knows that stuff is uh, decentralized exchanges uh, to, today. Uh, they're all subject to these high-profile security, and custodial, and regulatory, and other risks. Um, and, and we've seen that in the news recently, right? Um, and, and I don't want to take too much time here, but maybe it's the last theme I'll give you here, a third theme is just is that we have this like growing like modern demand for, for privacy and, and the liberalization of, of personal data. And so I think just like amidst like these several recent high profile data breaches, like I think Equifax, Ashley Madison, um, the data privacy is definitely top of mind these days. Uh, everyone has seen the rise of things like Snapchat, Telegram, Facebook secret messages, um, things that facilitate daily privacy in today's world of what feels like perfect information transparency. Uh, there's, al there's also like upcoming like GDPR regulations coming up in the EU in uh, second quarter of 2018, which I think we actually briefly talked about on our podcast with Aaron of Shopin. And, and Shopin is like has this really cool element of, of consumer privacy and seamless GDPR compliance built in. Um, but so privacy, um, that has always been a day one value proposition that crypto has had over fiat. And the community has continued to build around this point of differentiation with, you know, Ethereum's proposed adoption of ZK Snarks, right? Like Monero's Coral Reef outreach efforts. And just a lot of these, like, you see a lot of these new privacy-centric projects popping up. Zcoin, Enigma, like Mimblewimble is an interesting one. And it, look, well, well, we at Titan, I think we, we like privacy-centric use cases. We also have to be um, you know, thoughtful, I would say, about who ultimately wins in this space. Um, I guess, like, for example, right, like, while we really like Monero's privacy by, by default model, 
versus having to opt in to privacy with other coins like like Zcash or something. Um, if something like Bitcoin were to leverage the open source developments in blockchain privacy and adopt and integrate privacy by default features successfully in, in the Bitcoin one day, that, that, that really like erodes um, Monero's uh, staying power significantly. So we just have to be mindful of the, those sort of things. Yeah, I totally agree with all of, all of those points. And I think those are very good ways to uh, to think about the themes that will be worth investing, uh, at least in the cryptocurrency space. So the, the next question that I have is, when you look at uh, pre-ICO opportunities, what criteria do you use? Yeah, so you mean like pre-sales, right? Like these, yes. uh, these ICO pre-sales, private pre-sales. Um, and yeah, sure. So I guess just beyond like, uh, mm, yeah, so beyond like this consistency with our investable themes, we also like to see a couple of more specific things too. And it, look, a product doesn't have to hit all these criteria for us to invest, right? Like if you wait around for the perfect asset, you're never going to do a deal. Um, so you just have to think about what constitutes good enough for now at least. But obviously, with with conviction that there is asymmetric risk uh, reward to risk in the future, and I already touched on this idea of a true blockchain use case that makes more sense than a centralized solution. I think another important one is like a credible like a credible product roadmap that supports a project's vision, or just having clear technical descriptions of what is being built, um, an actionable time frame, measurable milestones, that sort of thing. Right? Everyone and their mom <laughs> has a good idea in space these days, uh, but implementation that's what's hard. And, and I'll take execution over ideas any day. Um, there's also like adoption feasibility where you'd want to see a product ecosystem um, where, where there's like a lot of active community engagement and high levels of developer mind share. Um, the management team, oh, the management team, super important, always top of mind, um, especially in these like early stage situations, right? Without a track record of historical business performance, um, the best you can get is the track record and quality of the team. And so, I think we have a whole subset of criteria just for the management team alone, and we'll always try to talk to the management team like multiple times before deploying dollars into their project. Um, and at the end of the day, I think the project can always pivot, but the core management team will not. So that's that's pretty that's pretty key. Uh, there's also um, like code integrity. So like to the extent like practicable, um, we'll have our engineers diligence any available code repositories that 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 a project might have. You know, map out their tech stack, see how they're they're thinking about scaling, make sure that the product is being represented right in the marketing materials and they're not taking any shortcuts today that will accrue, um, you know, like, like, like technical debt in the future. Um, and then, so, so yeah, so and then of course there's also, there's also the valuation we're getting in at. Um, that's another criteria that we have. That's, and that's, uh, that's pretty critical. We have to take a real hard look, I think at, at, at this um, criteria and, and just, Make sure that the tokenomics makes sense and that the value uh, value in the network does truly accrue to the token. Basically, that there is a logical explanation for why the token exists and is valuable. Otherwise, it could just be disintermediated. Um, and so I think people have to remember that investing in tokens is, is actually pretty different from investing in equity. Um, and so, so maybe the last thing I'll mention is, is the path to liquidity. So... Specifically, like exchange listings in the foreseeable future, so that we we as investors can de-risk at least a portion of our capital and not lock up our investment for for years. I think a lot of investors in the, in the space talk about this combination of venture capital economics with public markets liquidity. Um, I guess only to the degree that you're not unloading too much into a thin order book and moving price. But but anyway, this is a beautiful thing, right? Like that can't be understated. You can be a lot more flexible, like if you have constant access to liquidity. For instance, you could, you know, be more comfortable taking concentrated positions because you know you can always reallocate upon new diligence findings or new epiphanies you might have. Um, so, so yeah, let, let me stop there because I know I've said a lot and kind of probably rambled on there. Yeah, I think I think those were were, were pretty uh, clear answers, and yeah, I, I I agree with all of them. I think it's. You know, I'm obviously very lucky to to learn from you, um, like every day. So I think those are all the main questions that I have. We okay. will have uh, a, a lightning round as well. Um, but as far as the the main questions on in terms of your outlook on cryptocurrencies, that's that's all we have right now. So the lightning round is okay. something where uh, you know I want to ask you a question and maybe you can give me 
a very quick and very short, concise answer. Uh, the idea is, you know, lightning round should, should be fast like lightning. So mm, No promises there, but I'll try my best. Okay, so the first question that I have for you is, what makes you get out of the bed each morning? Well, well that's easy, right? But crypto prices and use for sure. Uh, and, and actually pushing time forward, actually, like, uh, I've kind of fallen in love with the process of starting something meaningful for myself. And so, like, working with team members who are, like, just not, like, really good friends of mine, but are also really thoughtful and equally, if not more passionate about this stuff as I am. So uh, I, I would just say that it's been an incredibly re rewarding experience thus far. Um, and, and I've learned a lot, right? Not, not only about crypto, but I've learned a ton about myself. Uh, and just, like, le learning how to fail, learning about leadership, and so much more. Got it. So the second one is, what's a skill that you really pride yourself in? Huh. So a skill that I really pride myself in. Well, I think if I were to pick like one one skill, mm. it'd probably be like active listening, like like really taking the time and spending the extra effort to really digest what someone is saying. Um, I think that sometimes when you just like shut up, like listen and resynthesize what someone just told you in your own words. You can show that like, you understand where the person, the other person is really coming from and form a stronger connection with them rather than just trying to force feed someone your opinions. Exactly. I agree 100%. The third question is, what's a relatively unknown fact about you? Wow. Well, um, a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of unknown facts about me. Um, but um, I, maybe one would be... So, so, so I guess here, I'll give you this, like, up until sophomore year, I thought I wanted to become a software engineer, specifically, like, I wanted to write software for NASA, uh, that was my dream, right? I was in I was in this program at USC's engineering school where people from, like, JPL up in Pasadena, um, SpaceX, Lockheed, they came to talk about what they were doing, and just being, like, the nerd and Star Wars fan that I am, that industry got me super excited, and there was just something, like, magical and transcendent about exploring space as humanity's final frontier, um, uh, unfortunately, I, well, I wasn't a U.S. citizen, so it's very difficult to, to break into these shops. And so I, I pivoted to the business and finance side of my studies, um, which I mean I ended up working out pretty pretty nicely. So, so no, uh, no, no real regrets regrets there. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good point. Uh, there's, it, I guess it's more practical to, to to get into finance, and it's similarly exciting as well. I don't know about that, but um, it's it's exciting for sure. <laughs> okay, so what's a bold view, bold view or a prediction that you have that's uh, contrarian for for the next ten years? Ten years, did you say? Yes. Okay, so like semi long term. Um, huh, I gotta think about that one for 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 a second here. Well, well, actually, like, and, hmm, and this might. Be like super out of left field, and I'll just like don't don't like quote me on this. But you know, one one thing that I came across like fairly recently is like decreasing like fertility rates as women are getting like more advanced degrees, like building out their careers, getting married later, um, and ultimately like having kids later. And so I think like peak fertility is at like 25 years, right? And the average age that a woman is having her first child is now creeping up to 30 and beyond, with kind of the rate of like birth complications exponentially spiking after like age 32 or something. And so I don't know if this is like a bold or contrarian prediction per se, but in order to prevent like a fertility crisis, like egg, fr egg freezing is going to be like a lucrative industry, right? The guys like Facebook are now offering egg freezing a as an employment benefit. A and just like putting putting on like my, my private equity hat here, like this could be a great business. You have like a SaaS-like dynamic um, in which you pay an initial, I think like $10,000 like setup fee to, to harvest eggs then like uh, like five hundred dollars if I remember correctly for, for storage and then like another like five thousand dollars to reinsert the eggs via in vitro fertilization IVF and so there's lots to like here about this business like recurring revenue stable cash flow high cost of failure as, as humans are hardwired to, to want to reproduce growth that's premised on secular trends like the, like the cultural acceptance of freezing eggs once you're 30 or something like trends of women in the workforce that stuff um, you get a lot of operating leverage as the incremental cost of storage shouldn't be that high and so yeah i remember like doing like the quick math like quick math the other day about and it's just like thinking through like the high level numbers here there's like you know like what 40 ish million women in, in the united states and like the 20 to 35 age range 
Um, and if you've seen like even like 20% penetration, that's like what, 8 million women at like $500 of like storage cost a year. That's, um, well, well, so that's a $4 billion spend just on recurring revenue alone, right? Just, just for storing eggs, like, um, main, like maintenance uh, fees. If you include like the harvesting and like IVF fees, it's probably at least double that number, right? It's probably at least like an $8 billion plus annual revenue industry, which, which ain't bad at all, right? <laughs> I mean, I guess I know what I'm doing if like, time doesn't work out. Yeah, <laughs> maybe that can be your next company, like George yeah. George's Eggs and Company. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a nice ring to it. So, what what do you what what are your favorite sources to to read to keep up to date with the world? Uh so like Cryptomania, I'd say CoinDesk Daily, obviously for crypto. The Wall Street Back Breakfast from Seeking Alpha is kind of nice. I mean, I think really just like social media feeds from people I respect. Um, Titans like message groups so that I can be kind of lazy and take advantage of other people's pre-filtered insights. I would say that's pretty, that's pretty, that one's pretty good. Got it. And what's a hobby or activity that you like to do in order to de-stress? Um, so, so I think, um, uh, going to the gym, like first thing most mornings, like really helps me recalibrate and take my mind down from like running a hundred miles per hour all the time. And so, and actually, like walking to the gym too, right? Like while listening to, to like a podcast or audiobook, that really clears my mind. Um, here in SF, I, I think I live really close to the water, um, and so I can just get like beautiful views just traveling on foot around the marina and Russian Hill area. Got it. And finally, what's overhyped in today's world? Uh, yeah, what's overhyped other than ICOs? Overhyped day. So. so I remember mentioning the $10 green juices in the lab post podcast with Aaron. Um, and so like something else, I guess that is overhyped. Um, I, I, I'll say uh, steakhouses are overhyped. Like so there's, there's like very little value out there, right? Unless they're sourcing like a super rare cut of like Matsusaka A5 or something. And their margins are still super high given the lower prep and labor fees because it's so easy to cook steak, right? Just season with salt, pepper, butter. You don't even need like a super well-trained chef. And so unless they're sourcing like hard to find like unique cuts of meat, I feel like steakhouses are pr probably like relatively overvalued. Um, though I suppose, you know, sometimes you're just lazy and you should just like treat yourself. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I, th I think we took mm -hmm. a couple of lessons in San Francisco cooking school and I'm pretty confident yeah. that I can cook a restaurant quality steak. Uh, but I guess people go to these steakhouses for... I guess like dates or like social events and maybe to, to treat business partners, for example. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and yeah, I think your Instagram looks great. Like I would eat your steak over like a steakhouse steak anytime. All right. Yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, it's, I've, I've taken like over 80 hours uh, learning from pr pretty good chefs and like listening to Chef uh, Patterson uh, of of Qua Talk, a two-star Michelin yeah. restaurant in San Francisco. So, yeah, thank you so much, uh, George, for your time today. I think uh, a lot of the things that you say that, that you said were very insightful, and I'm sure the viewers will enjoy it. Well, well, I hope so. And th thanks, Sean, for for taking the time here to interview me. I know you're a busy guy, so um, this this is great. Thank thanks for sort of doing driving this. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yep, likewise.